All right, we're looking at a commentator about what was brought up in chapter 5 of Hebrews. And chapter 7 has some good references. Hebrews 7, 12. For when the priesthood is changed from Moronic to Melchizedek, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. Interesting. The connection between the priesthood and the law means that a change in the one involves a change in the other. The author is speaking of more than a transference of the office of priest from one person to another. He is speaking of a change from one kind of priesthood to another. Priesthood, like that of Melchizedek, differs fundamentally from that after the order of Aaron. Christ is not another Aaron. He replaces Aaron with a priesthood that is both different and better and forever. And with the Aaronic priesthood went the law that had been erected <clears throat> with that priesthood as its basis. Lacking that priesthood, the law had to give away, give way. It had lost its basis. So the author says there must be a change of law. Hebrews 7.13, for the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe. Judah, Jesus, from which no one has officiated at the altar. So, commentator says, the change in the law is seen in that Jesus did not belong to the tribe recognized by the law as a, the priestly tribe. His tribe was different, which may mean no more than that it was another, than uh, the priestly tribe, or that the tribe, that tribe was of diff a different nature. It was a non-priestly tribe. <clears throat> in fact, it was a royal tribe. From this tribe, no one has ever served at the altar. Because Christ served he was the altar of payment, final payment for sins. There's no more need for sacrifice because of the one for all, once for all time sacrificed by Christ on the cross that literally paid for the sins of the whole world. There is a change of tense from the perfect and the word translated belonged to an aorist completed action in that rendered served. Zunz comments, the differentiation is excellent. It intimates mates, that no one of the tribe of Judah had ever attended to the altar, and that Jesus has permanently a share in that tribe cited by Bruce. David and Solomon, who were of the tribe of Judah, are said to have offered sacrifice. You see these passages. But two things should be said about this. In the first place, it is possible that these kings did not do the actual ceremonial. It is unlikely that Solomon personally offered 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep, the awful busy. David and Solomon may have offered in the sense that they provided to others the sacrificial victims leaving priests to perform the liturgical function. And in the second place, even if these kings did something, sometimes perform the actual offering, this was occasional and not their regular function. The author is speaking of the regular administrations of a priest at the altar, and this none but the sons of Aaron did in the Old Testament period. Hebrews 7.14, for it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. So the commentator says on this verse, for, inter for the word for, introduces the explanation of the preceding. The author calls Jesus our Lord again only in 13.20. Mostly his use of the term Lord is for their father, but there is no doubt as to whom he means here. His verb, descended, is un unusual in this case. A Buchanan can go as far as to say, in none of the Old Testament usages of the verb, anateline, was it employed to mean a descendant of a certain tribe or family. Anatelion, I guess, means rise, spring up, and may be used of the rising of a star or of the up, springing up of a shoot from the roots of, of a planet. A plant. The author may have in mind the rising of a star or more likely the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah being a shoot from the root of David. Jeremiah 23 5 uses this cognate noun for this purpose. Here in verse 14 Jesus is said to have come from Judah. This and Revelation 5 5 being the only places outside the nativity stories to say explicitly that this was his tribe. And to this tribe, Moses had nothing to say about priests. The law did not envision, envisage priests 
from any tribe other than Levi. This is what made the priesthood like that of Melchizedek so unusual. 715. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such not in the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, verse 17, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. Mosaic law, of course. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So the author of Hebrews goes on to say, the expositor rather, goes on to say, Christ's priesthood superior because of his life, 715 to 19. The author pursues this theme of the superiority of Christ. He sees him as superior because of his life, the divine oath, the permanence of his priesthood and his sacrifice. First, he indicates the importance of the fact that Christ is not limited by death as the Levitical priests were. And a discussion with some Jehovah Witnesses. And they just don't get that. Why would Jesus be uh, a high priest of a, a priesthood that is not eternal or not God? No beginning and no end. Not no beginning and no end, right? And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek. Verse 15, the commentator says, what is it that is even more clear is not said. There is nothing in the Greek equivalent to the NIV's what we have said. Westcott thinks it is the ineffectiveness of the Levitical priesthood, Moffat, another author or commentator, that it is the abrogation of the law. More likely, the expression is general and is meant to include both. Possibly also that Jesus came not from Levi, but from Judah. It is the appearance of a priest like Melchizedek that is the decisive factor that negates anything that is temporal. Temporal. It's eternal. Christ's priesthood is eternal. Bible study manuals. I comment on this guy's searching around for stuff that may, is not there. So here's a clear declaration that Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek. Since Jesus is God and since Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek, then Melchizedek is God. They pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Done and done. Baiting around the bush. This one says that. This one says that. Hebrews 7.16 Who has become such, not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. It says that. How can you miss that? Well, here's the commentator. This priest is distinguished by the quality of his life. Yes. Being indestructible. Why don't you add that? A regulation as to his ancestry renders an expression that is literally a law of a fleshly commandment. This includes his ancestry, but it may well be wider. The ancestry of Melchizedek. What? It includes all that is fleshly about the law. As Robinson puts it, the command is one which belongs to the realm of man's physical nature and bears only indirectly on his spiritual being. By contrast, ironic priesthood is being viewed there. By contrast, Christ's priesthood depends on the power, which means more than authority, of an indestructible life. There's a special quality about the life of Christ. Not special. There's a, there's a quality about the life of Christ that's indestructible. Get specific. Neither does it end, nor can it end. So then the Melchizedek priesthood can neither end, begin. has no ending or no beginning. It's eternal. Therefore, Christ can be a priest of the order of oh, how. I don't know how they, he doesn't, beats around the bush. The description of him as the prince or author of life. Okay, great. So he's the creator. And here it is. Hebrews 7, 17. For it is attested of him, you are a priest order forever. Priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, which is a priest of, that's forever. No beginning, no, oh. Well, here he goes on to say, for, for introduce the clinching testimony of scripture, this passage cited, gives the reason for the foregoing. It is quoted verbatim as in 5, 6, where we have commentary. That's why I'm working on this chapter 7 of Hebrews. It goes into more detail. It establishes the special character of Christ's priesthood because of no other priest could it be said that his life was indestructible. Well, no other priesthood either. Melchizedek, 
though it could be said that the Aaronic priesthood has a pre was a priesthood that will continue for all generations, no individual priest is forever. Yeah, it goes generation to generation, but the priesthood in Aaronic is described as temporal. Each priest dies. How many priests in the Melchizedek priesthood die? None. It's forever. We can't have a single priest, even Melchizedek, as a priest, has to be forever. And it does say his priesthood is forever. So if he dies, then it, the priesthood is not forever. Wow, don't you get that? Hebrews 7, 18. For on the one hand, there is not, there's a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. Verse 18, commentary. The opening words might more literally be rendered, for there is an annulling of a foregoing commandment where annulling is a legal term that points to the complete cancellation of the commandment in question. Regulation refers, as in verse 16, to the whole law. The Levitical system in its entirety is set aside by the coming and the work of Christ. At the same time, former implies a connection. The Levitical system was not simply earlier in time. It also prepared the way for the coming of Christ, but it had to give way because it was weak and unprofitable. It could not give men strength to meet all the needs of life because man is flawed. He can't keep the law in order to gain eternal life. It could not bring men salvation. Verse 7, 19 of Hebrews, For the law made nothing perfect. Amen. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. The parentheses underlies the defects of the law. The writer does not explain what he means by made perfect. I can tell you what he means made perfect without sin. Right? But clearly he has in mind something like made fit for God. Yes, absolute righteousness. Come on, speak out. The law did not give people complete and lasting access to the presence of God because they are flawed and so is the priesthood flawed. It had its merits, but it did not satisfy their deep needs. It had no merit. Their deep needs wouldn't be satisfied. It wasn't spiritual at all. Because people couldn't keep the law, they weren't spiritual. For the writer's use of a better, see comments 1, 4, and for his use of hope, see the comments in 3, 6, and 6, 11, the thought of what is better is characteristic of Hebrews. And hope is central to the Christian way. Notice that the hope is, in, is said to be better than the regulation or co of commandment because it relies on Christ's righteousness, not your own, not better than the hope associated with the commandment, because it's useless and, and so flawed. Law and gospel stand in contrast, absolutely. Gospel is by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works. If you try to get saved by the law, your first mistake will be your last. The gospel is better because it enables people to draw near to God by grace, and then God's declaration. For example, when you flaw, you're flawed, you commit a sin, it says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive these sins because you confessed them, the wrongdoing, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If that isn't grace, I don't know what it is. It, is, it was this that the old way could not bring about, but the new way can. Hebrews 7.20, And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests, without an oath, but he with an oath, Christ with an oath, and God with an with oath uh, committed, said an oath to his promise, to the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. There's your oath. By God the Father, to Jesus, you are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now, all this time I was talking to the Jehovah Witnesses, and he said, it doesn't say the word Jesus in Hebrews. Here it is, Jesus, and many other places. They're grasping at straws when you present the gospel through the book of Hebrews. Anyway, the commentator says, the divine oath, which God swore that Christ was high priest of the order of Melchizedek, the argument is now developed. This should be 22, I'm pretty sure. The argument is now developed with reference to the oath which God swore that Christ was high priest on the order of Melchizedek. That established the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. God the Father says, this man, this man, this priest, 
No beginning, no end, no parents, no...